Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you so i have lots of different research projects going on at any particular time one of the things that i am currently working on is the excavation of the first baptist church of philadelphia cemetery in philadelphia this was a cemetery that was rediscovered during construction According to the historic records, this cemetery was relocated in 1860. I think the oldest fingerprints, the oldest, you know, what I would call usable fingerprints, meaning that you can see the details within the fingerprints. And it's those details that we use for making comparisons. The oldest fingerprints that I've worked on so far have been from about 3000 BC, around 3000, three and a half thousand BC from Mesopotamia. So about 5,000 oh, wow. years old. And, you know, it's clay. Once the clay hardens, as long as there's no kind of abrasion or anything like that, that fingerprint is locked in that clay, you know, literally for millennial for, for thousands of years. Increased stress is linked with teeth grinding and clenching, which causes poor sleep, jaw pain, and headaches. But did you know that one in every four adults grind or clench their teeth while they're sleeping? A Remy custom night guard can protect your teeth from grinding and clenching while saving you hundreds of dollars compared to getting one at the dental office. Use code GUARD20 for 20% off your order. Visit shopremy.com now. S-H-O-P-R-E-M-I dot com. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Kimberly Sue Moran, She's an associate teaching professor and a director of forensics, part of the Department of Chemistry at Rutgers University in Camden, New Jersey. We're going to talk about uh, her research and her work. So, Kimberly, thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me, Richard. It's great to be here. If you would, tell me about your current research. It sounds very intriguing and unusual. Sure. Well, so I have lots of different research projects going on at any particular time. One of the things that I am currently working on is the excavation of the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia Cemetery in Philadelphia. This was a cemetery that was rediscovered during construction. According to the historic records, this cemetery was relocated in 1860, but it very much was not relocated. So when construction began in 2016, Lots of bones, human remains were coming out of the ground and kind of nobody really knew what to do. So myself and some volunteers got involved in the project. We excavated the site. And, you know, after about a, a year of various things happening, we have about 500 individuals that have come from that site. And we're doing all sorts of research from DNA to metagenomics, lipidomics, all kinds of different you know, flavors of science to understand more about this snapshot of Philadelphia history. So that's one project that I'm currently working on. My background in forensic archaeology mm. means that I have the benefit of having kind of one foot in the past and one foot in the present. So sometimes I'm working on archaeological projects. Sometimes I'm working on kind of modern forensic science. So one of my kind of more forensic projects that I'm working on is looking at decomposition and how the body decomposes, what are some of the variables or what variables affect that decomposition more than others. 
And then how does that impact crime scene when we're going to recover human remains? So that's another project that I have going on. And there's, you know, many, many more from ancient fingerprints to modern fingerprints, toxicology, just all sorts of different things. Okay. Yeah, when you're saying you had one foot here and one foot there, because you just spoke about the graveyard, I was going to say one foot in the grave, but that's not yes. true. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, I might literally have a foot in the, That's what right. I'm excavating at the time. Well, since you have so many projects, I don't know, uh, you know, you'll pick, I guess, house rules. What, what, what are some of the most interesting ones that you worked on? And let's, uh, let's ask questions around those. Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about ancient fingerprints, because that's something that I've been working on for almost 20 years now that is kind of like a slow simmer. You know, a lot of other projects happen because there's an immediate need. So, for instance, with the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia Cemetery, you know, bones were coming out of the ground right now. So we had to kind of spring into action. Other projects, again, are very kind of time bound. But the ancient fingerprints are something that I've been working on for most of my career. Um, So really, it came about as a graduate student, my, my degree is in forensic archaeological science. So I had to do a, an, a research project for that degree. And I ended up getting myself involved in the world of fingerprinting. I was watching one of these forensic TV shows. I don't even remember which one it was, but it was one that's based on like real life cases. And the case that was featured in this particular episode that gave me the idea for my what eventually became my, my master's research, it was a case where a woman had been murdered in her apartment and the police were fairly sure who was responsible. It was somebody else who lived in this apartment complex that kind of had a, a known criminal history. And the only evidence that was left at the crime scene was a bloody handprint left on the bed sheets. And so the fingerprint examiner was given these bed sheets and, you know, thought, well, huh, you know, I, I know how to develop fingerprints that are left in blood, but I've never really worked with fabric before. So I guess I'll just give it a shot and just use, you know, one of the tools that, you know, are, is pretty typical. So there's a particular stain that stains the proteins in blood. It's called amino black. And as the name suggests, it turns blood fingerprints kind of a blue or blue black color. And so he treated this piece of evidence, the only piece of evidence from the crime scene, and Yes, it turns the fingerprints blue black, but it also turned the entire bed sheet black as well. And so, you know, again, this was a TV show. I'm sure it was probably a little more dramatic than it was in real life, but it was presented as if the only piece of evidence from the crime scene was now, you know, possibly destroyed because it had been stained, you know, completely black. By the end of the episode, they had, you know, washed the bed sheet enough times that the background staining had faded enough that they could see the fingerprint, the handprint. And they were able to, you know, match it to the the suspect and the suspect was caught in this crime. So as I was watching this TV show, I thought to myself, well, huh, you know, we've got lots of different types of fabrics. We have fabrics that are made out of natural fibers like cotton and uh, linen and wool. And we've got fabrics that are synthetic, you know, mainly made out of petroleum products, you know, polyester, nylon, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there are lots of different chemicals that you can use for fingerprints left in blood. I wonder if some chemicals would be better for some fabrics than others. And so to make a long story short, that ended up being my research project was developing the best chemical technique to use depending on the type of fabric that you had at hand. And what this did was introduce me to the world of fingerprints. I I worked very closely with a fingerprint laboratory in the course of my research. I was trained by them to the level of fingerprint expert. And one of the things that kind of became kind of part of that training was understanding how to use the software that um, contains the databases, the fingerprint databases, the APHIS, Automated Fingerprint Identification System, and they store fingerprints and they are able to compare fingerprints. And you still need a human operator. The machines are not are still not as good as humans at comparing fingerprints, but they certainly speed up the process. If you have hundreds and hundreds of fingerprints that you're trying to compare, it can whittle it down to just a few suggestions that you can then do a a manual comparison. So I thought to myself, well, we've got this database with hundreds of millions of offender fingerprints in this database. You know, I, I wonder if there could be another sort of database that could be created, one for more like academic research purposes. So particularly in archaeology, most artifacts are made out of clay. And if anyone's kind of played with Play-Doh or clay or sticky tack or whatever, you know, you leave your fingerprints behind as you mold and shape those objects. So I thought, well, 
would it be possible to capture fingerprints that have been left on artifacts and create an ancient database of fingerprints to see if we could actually find fingerprints that match each other that might be at different sites or on different pieces of, of material to say that the same person made them. And so that led to my, to, you know, what I've now spent basically the last 20 years of my life doing is working on ancient fingerprints, looking at artifacts from all around the world, capturing those fingerprints and doing comparisons and putting them into, into a database of ancient fingerprints. Well, okay. Remy night guards are designed for comfort. Remy sends you an at-home impression kit and has a team of in-house dental professionals to make you custom, comfortable night guards that you'll forget you're wearing, all for 80% less than the cost at the dental office. Visit shopremy.com to get yours now and take an extra 20% off your order with the code GUARD20 at checkout. Remember, that's S-H-O-P-R-E-M-I dot com. What are some of the nuances of finding old fingerprints? Like how long do they seem to last? What conditions make them last? You know, so you can still read them. Yeah. So, I mean, they can last thousands of years. I think the oldest fingerprints, the oldest, you know, what I would call usable fingerprints, meaning that you can see the details within the fingerprints and it's those details that we use for making comparisons. The oldest fingerprints that I've worked on so far have been from about 3000 BC, around 3000, three and a half thousand BC from Mesopotamia. So about 5,000 oh, wow. years old. And, you know, it's clay. Once the clay hardens, as long as there's no kind of abrasion or anything like that, that fingerprint is locked in that clay, you know, literally for millennial for, for thousands of years. So was there, um, was there anything dif- different about ancient fingerprints you found or the same whorls and loops and ridges we have today? Same loops and whorls that we have today, same ridges that we have today. The one interesting thing is that a lot of ancient cultures really go out of their way to remove <laughs> the fingerprints from their objects. So whether it's tablets, whether it's pottery, you know, there are, there's lots of other kind of marks in the clay to show where they've smoothed away any potential fingerprints. So usually the best place to find fingerprints are on the insides of objects. You know, broken pottery is really great because you can get inside the vessel and see the the surfaces that they didn't care about so much. And then that's where you're likely to find the fingerprints. Was there any uh, ancient art that deliberately used fingerprints or handprints or footprints or any of that stuff? Yeah, there's lots of ancient art that does use handprints. It doesn't necessarily retain the actual fingerprint detail, but there are pots. There's some pots from Scandinavia where the maker, you know, pushed in their fingernail on the tip of their finger as a way to to make a, a just a repeating pattern to decorate the pots. So again, you're able to kind of you know match the fingerprints to say, okay, well, this person made, you know, decorated these vessels and a different person decorated these vessels. One of the really fun sets of artifacts that I have worked on recently are some clay lamps from Israel. They're little oil lamps and they're, they're made in two parts. There's a, a lid to the lamp and then there's the body of the lamp. And in this particular, basically pile of junk, you know, this is a, a dump where they just threw away a bunch of the stuff that they didn't want anymore. It was imperfect or, you know, they couldn't sell it or whatever the reason was. In this dump, there is a series of lamps that all have kind of the same style. And underneath the lid, again, where nobody could see, just by the hole where you would have the wick for the lamp is a perfectly preserved index finger that has been impressed with the, with the, the maker's fingerprint. And the same fingerprint is in the same location on this series of lamps. So, you know, in, in my opinion, that is very much intentional that this individual was basically marking their work with their fingerprint. How do you feel when you find an ancient fingerprint? Do you feel like you got like a chill or a weird feeling or what do you think about it? Oh, it's super exciting. You know, I find a lot of what we call friction ridge detail, the little individual ridges. I find a lot of ridges or ridge marks on pottery, but very rarely do you get a perfect fingerprint, you know, where you actually can see the arch, the loop of the world. So whenever you, whenever I get to see like that pattern, it's just really exciting and you really, you know, you are literally seeing the person who made that artifact. So, I mean, what do these ancient fingerprints tell you? Is it just like a nice, fun thing to find them? Or what, what can you learn about the individual or their circumstance from them? There's lots that you can learn from these marks that are left behind. You know, traditionally in archaeology, 
yeah, they have just been seen as this kind of fun thing, like, oh, we found a fingerprint, you know, we'll be kind of in the report or in the academic paper or whatever, but they don't really do anything with that fingerprint. So some of the things that you can do with the fingerprint is, you know, again, depending on how much rich detail has been preserved, you can work out which finger of the hands that fingerprint came from and whether it was the right hand or the left hand. So sometimes that can tell you whether an individual was right-handed or left-handed. These fingerprints are very much like tool marks. They show you how the object was handled, manipulated, how it was crafted. Going back to these oil lamps, they're made in a mold. So they have a a stone that they carve and they basically squish the the clay into the mold to then, you know, make the lamp top. So you can actually see the marks that show kind of the direction of the fingers, how they're smearing it into the the mold. So it gives you a lot of kind of manufacturer information. Um, But then if you are able to find multiple objects, then again, you can track an individual as they make different things. If you find fingerprints at different archeological sites, you know that either that individual is traveling around or there's trade happening between those sites. So there's just, you know, there's all sorts of of information. Now, one caveat that I am going to throw out there. So there have been lots of papers that look at ancient fingerprints to see if you can tell the age of the individual, you know, if they're a kid, if they're middle-aged or whatever, and to see if they're, if you can determine the sex of the individual, if they're male or female. And the, the method that's been used is measuring kind of the, the thicknesses of the ridges and how dense the ridges are packed in like a square millimeter. There does seem to be pretty good evidence to suggest that women have denser ridges, that they, they tend to have more ridges in the same amount of space than, than males do. But forensically, if you were going to take this to a court of law and actually put someone in prison with a fingerprint saying, you know, this fingerprint is is a male fingerprint, that would never hold up. There just isn't enough research. There aren't enough population studies to really back up whether, you know, you could definitely tell somebody's sex and, and particularly with age, because there's just so much human variation. And we really have not nailed down the statistics sufficiently Certainly for a court of of law, there are some archaeologists that I guess their burden of proof is pretty low and they're satisfied with 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 saying that you can determine age and sex based on the limited data that's available. But I think there needs to be a lot more research before we can we can use fingerprints to determine the age and sex of an individual. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and working on a product to help people overcome these problems, uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Well, you mentioned looking at sex, but what about age? How do people's fingerprints change as they age? So again, a lot of, of human variation. Kind of a good a good example is, you know, if you've ever done the little like arts and crafts activity where you ink your finger and you put it on a balloon and you blow the balloon up and your fingerprint expands, that's basically what happens as you grow. So when you're an infant, you have exactly the same fingerprint that you will have throughout your entire life barring any kind of scars or additions that are that are made, you know, through cutting through the finger or whatever. But the actual pattern that you're born with is the same pattern that you will have for your entire life. But that pattern just expands as your finger grows, as you get bigger. And again, growth rates are not steady. Some people grow faster than other people. As we get older, we shrink and our skin loses elasticity. So we wrinkle a lot in older age. So again, there just hasn't been enough research done to show, you know, with any kind of level of consistency that you could work across populations and say that, you know, whatever formula for measuring the distance between the ridges would give you an accurate age. 
Okay, so you can kind of tell age in a ballpark sense, or you can't tell it. Like, what, what can you tell about age? I mean, so you could you could cert. I mean, you could certainly say that you know individual A has you know uh, you know much more ridge density or you know smaller ridges than individual B. But again, I, myself personally, I would be very hesitant to assign an age to that that individual. So where are you going with this project? What's what's your goal with it? What questions do you want to answer? So you know, basically, the more artifacts that we can find with fingerprints, the better our data set will get. And then also within each of these assemblages, these groups of artifacts, you know, using fingerprints to to answer questions related to the sites, the artifacts themselves. So really, you know, I think probably at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is for the archaeological community to realize that fingerprints are artifacts in their own right, that they're not just this fun thing that you find, that they actually can add to the data set and the interpretation of your artifacts or your your site when you excavate it. So just kind of raising awareness that, you know, fingerprints should be studied just like any other aspect of of an artifactual assemblage. Um, Have you found that different cultures or ethnicities have different fingerprints or it doesn't matter? Well, again, we really don't have enough research to say definitively. There have been some studies that suggest that folks of a European descent tend to have more arches, that uh, people from an Asian descent tend to have more loops, uh, from African descent tend to have more whirls. But again, we just really haven't done the population statistics like we've done with, say, DNA, to be able to really say that these markers hold true. And also, you know, we're looking at modern populations when we when we make these kind of assertions. You know, we can't go back necessarily in the past to say whether certain people groups tended to have, you know, the same sort of patterns that we have today. I mean, I thought it was very interesting that this is, this group of artifacts from Israel, um, you know, it was very clear an arch that was that was located. And arches are very rare. Only five percent of all fingerprints are going to be arches. So. You know, that was that was pretty unusual, I thought. So what's uh, what's one more project that you want to discuss that, uh, that you find very interesting? We'll do one more, I guess. Sure. So I'll go I'll go back to the First Baptist Church of Philadelphia Cemetery. So, as I mentioned before, this was a cemetery that was impacted by construction and through the efforts of a whole bunch of volunteers. We were able to kind of do a salvage archaeological project that resulted in the excavation of about 500 human remains. And we've been given access to study these remains for about five years. They'll actually be reburied in September of 2023. And, you know, what's been so so fantastic about this project and why, for me personally, it's such a privilege to be part of it, is it's one of the few occasions where we've really pulled in people from all sorts of different disciplines. So at the core, we have archaeologists, historians, and bioanthropologists kind of looking at the human remains themselves. But then we're working with geneticists to help us identify who is related to who, so that way we can rebury them in family groups. Um, We're doing an interesting project where we're looking at the plaque on people's teeth and genetically sequencing it to find human pathogens, to find diseases. And we have actually identified syphilis and tuberculosis and some other diseases in, in this dental plaque. Um, We have a number of individuals whose brains have been preserved. They've been mummified. And so we're doing a project looking at the lipids in the brain, the kind of fatty molecules as markers of things like Alzheimer's. And again, we've identified some individuals that have markers that suggest that they may have had Alzheimer's when they die. One of the challenges with this cemetery is that except for about five individuals, nobody has any tombstones or nameplates or any way to identify them. So we're trying to use all of this science and linking it to the historic record to be able to actually assign names to individuals. So we have one person in particular who we've got data saying that, you know, he may have died from a certain disease. He was this age when he died looking at his skeleton. It's a male. And we've done some isotope analysis, which basically tells you like what part of the country you're living in at different stages of your life. And we feel like we're getting pretty close to an actual name to actually being able to identify this individual, looking at death records, looking at other historic documents, you know, all the, it's kind of, it is kind of like historic detective work, 
trying to put all these different strings of science together to, to actually name and identify these folks prior to them being reburied. Well, how do you identify them? Like what, you know, you have the body and stuff, but um, do you have records that match who is buried there or how do you know who's who? Yeah, so we've got lots of different sources of records. The First Baptist Church of Philadelphia had some burial records, um, but then we also have records from the city of Philadelphia that are called bills of, of bills of mortality, where they say who died and where they were buried and, you know, various biographical information about them. So, you know, we have a skeleton. We know that he died roughly between 1750 and 1800. We know that he had a certain disease. We know that he was about 55 when he died. And so we can look through all the death records and we've got nearly 2000 death records to find somebody who meets that profile, who is a male around 55, died within that kind of time window, you know, had these certain ailments. And again, just kind of by process of elimination, get it down to this particular person. Now, the next step and one of the things that we're discussing as a team, you know, is, you know, our ethical responsibility. Should we reach out to the possible family and ask for, say, a DNA sample to actually see whether this is their ancestor? You know, we have to decide, you know, whether that's the right thing to do or whether we just say, okay, it's probably this person. And then this person gets reburied with everybody else in 2023. Well, I would think if uh, if a family has any possibility that one of their relatives was in the graveyard, they would probably jump at the chance to corroborate that it is or isn't their relative, right? Sure, but, but I mean, you can never assume. <laughs> you know, some people well, um, are are super fine with death, and you know, are very connected to their family members. Some people want nothing to do with any of this, and you know, it could be quite a shock to one day get a call saying, "Hey, I've got your great 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 grandfather." So just thinking about like, you know, the appropriateness of, of how you would reach out to somebody. Also, you know, remember I said that this cemetery supposedly was relocated in 1860. There are a number of people that were dug up in 1860 that were sent to other cemeteries. So this individual might be, you know, quote unquote, buried someplace else. So this family all this time has thought that this grave marker has their great, 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 great grandfather buried beneath it. And then to find out that actually, no, it's some stranger that we have their their ancestor. Like, you know, that could cause a lot of turmoil for somebody. So, you know, again, we're we're trying to navigate what it, what is the right thing to do, what is the ethically most responsible thing to do. And, you know, and we're working with the First Baptist Church to kind of answer those questions. You know, we don't want to like jump into things without kind of doing our due diligence. Well, I mean, what have you noticed among the families that you contact? You said there's it's you know, not all of them react the same, but what are some reactions that uh that were either commonplace or intrigued you or surprised you? Sure. So we have I mean, you know. The, when the cemetery was excavated, there was a lot of news coverage. And we had about maybe 20 people reach out to us saying, hey, I think I actually have, you know, ancestors that were buried there. And those individuals have been very, you know, open and willing to submit DNA if we get to that point. And we always keep them, you know, up, you know, up to date with what's going on with the research. But, you know, certainly at the time when it was when, you know, the, the cemetery excavation was in the news and floating around on, on social media, there were lots of people that were like, you know, these people should not be touched. They should just be left alone or, you know, they shouldn't be studied. They should be put right back in the ground immediately. You know, there, there were folks that came by the site and left car, like prayer cards and flowers. So, you know, there was a real kind of range of reactions. And you know, and that's because death is very much linked to our culture, our religious beliefs. And it's a very personal thing, how we how we feel about death and how we respond to death. Oh, are there any, I don't know, interesting cases where you found someone that people were looking for or, you know, someone of a certain importance or mystery or? Yeah. So so we have uh, somebody who is recorded to have been buried in this cemetery, Samuel Miles. He was a mayor of Philadelphia, you know. You know, way, way back in the early days and pretty famous guy. There's portraits of him in the uh, National Portrait Gallery and, you know, very, very well known name. A number of the folks that reached out to us when the cemetery was in the news were ancestors of Miles. And um, some of them were 
actually very happy to hear about the excavation because, again, the cemetery supposedly was relocated in 1860. It was relocated to a cemetery called Mount Moriah, which is outside of the city of Philadelphia. There is a section in Mount Moriah that is devoted to this particular church. And there are some headstones to some of the more famous members of the church. So there is a headstone to Samuel Miles in Mount Moriah, but it's unclear as to whether Samuel Miles was relocated in 1860 or whether this is just a monument kind of just acknowledging him. Mount Moriah fell into disrepair in the early 2000s. It became completely overgrown. The city of Philadelphia ended up taking it over. And some of the family members of Samuel Miles, really, it, they found it really upsetting the state of the cemetery. And when they went to go visit Samuel My Miles' tombstone, just how overgrown and just kind of disastrous the cemetery was at that time. So they actually found a great deal of comfort thinking that maybe Samuel Miles was not at Mount Moriah, maybe he was part of the collection that we excavated. Now, we haven't necessarily identified him, uh, or at least not yet. Um, we know that Samuel Miles was shot in the foot, so that's great information. So as we are analyzing all of these skeletons, but something to be on the lookout for is for like some kind of foot injury of a male of a certain age. But that's, you know, that's one example of one of the family reactions that we've had. Okay. Looking into the future, what just briefly, is there a project that you're working on that you're, you don't have results yet, but you think will be super promising or interesting that you want to just, you know, briefly discuss? Yeah. So uh, one of the, one of the projects that's kind of in its infancy, I mentioned earlier, we were doing a project looking at plaque and being able to determine diseases based on, you know, the literally the germs that are still in the plaque. One of the diseases that we know killed a large number of people in Philadelphia generally, but also a large number of folks that are buried at the cemetery is yellow fever. Philadelphia had a number of yellow fever epidemics in the late 1700s, and there was one in particular that killed thousands of, of people. Um, and it's the right date range for our cemetery as well. But the problem with yellow fever is it's a type of virus that's really hard to detect. It's an RNA virus rather than a DNA virus. So it doesn't sequence easily. RNA breaks down quite quickly. The other challenge with yellow fever is it's a bloodborne pathogen. So if you have skeletons, you don't have any blood. So we're developing a project to help us hopefully determine whether an individual had yellow fever at the time of death. We're looking at the teeth. Um, inside your teeth, the dental pulp of your tooth is an area that actually captures the last little remaining bits of blood prior to death. And so we're working to extract that dental pulp, identify the blood, and then look for proteins that are related to yellow fever to actually see whether somebody had yellow fever in their system at the time of death. So again, it's really early stage, but it would be absolutely a game changer. And again, would help us identify individuals if we know their sex, their age at death, and now we know that they died of yellow fever, that would really help us identify people. So that's what we're working on at the moment. Well, very cool. You get to work on uh, super cool projects. You know. So what's, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and see some images of what you found? Where can they go? Sure. So if folks want to learn more about the Arch Street Project, it is just archstreetproject.org. Or you can just Google Art Sheet Project. You'll find the website as well. Um, they can just Google me, Kimberly Moran, at Rutgers, and um, they can see some of the other projects and lots of images of various things that we've been working on over the years. So those are usually the best places to look. Very good. Well, Kim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. Before you go, make sure to protect your smile from teeth grinding and clenching with a Remy Custom Night Guard. Visit shopremy.com to get yours now and take an extra 20% off your order with the code GUARD20 at checkout. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.